Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber, and uh, I am honored and uh, feel very privileged today to have uh, guitar player Jerry McPherson as our guest. Um, a lot of you probably know who Jerry is. He's been a first call A-list Nashville studio musician for over 25 years. And what you got to understand is that Jerry is the celebrity of the celebrities, meaning that when top artists come in and decide who they want to have play on their recordings, they hope that Jerry's available. Okay, And if you've seen the movie The Wrecking Crew on Netflix, that'll give you a great idea of the kind of work Jerry does. Is that, is that a fair statement, Jerry? Well, yeah, I, I, I can definitely wreck a song in no time flat. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm He's here till Saturday, folks. Yes, uh, yes. Try the veal. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's definitely one of Nashville's modern day Wrecking Crew members. And, and let me just share some facts with you about Jerry. He holds a U.S. patent for a robotic microphone system that he personally built and designed for his studio. He taught Sandra Bullock how to play Smoke on the Water. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's highlight of Jerry's career. Uh, <laughs> he had 17 guitars along with his main guitar rig underwater during the Nashville flood in 2010. And we'll talk a little bit about that. His son, Miles, Miles McPherson, is also an A-list session drummer in Nashville. And Miles recently won American Country Music's Drummer of the Year for 2017 and jerry and miles often get called to play together in the same session and we'll talk about that because that's got to be awesome jerry's played on the following artists albums and cds and i had to trim this list down or we'd actually never get to the actual interview <laughs> uh i'm going to present it as jerry presented it to me vince gill insane clown posse barry manilow and that'll be the first and last time you ever hear insane clown posse and barry manilow's name mentioned side by side uh miranda lambert christina aguilera faith hill Tim McGraw, Kelly Clarkson, Rascal Flatts, Leanne Rimes, Burt Bacharach, Chris Martin of Coldplay, the late Chris Cornell of Soundgarden, Chris Isaac, Don Henley, Reba McIntyre, Cheap Trick, Kelly Pickler, Glenn Campbell, the great Glenn Campbell, Michael McDonald, the Doobie Brothers, Lady Antebellum, Keith Urban, Dolly Parton, Kenny Rogers, Toby Keith, and literally hundreds of other artists. I've also been told by a number of different Nashville players, Jerry's one of, if not the nicest guy in Nashville. Aw, did they really say that? They did. Honestly, man. And, and <laughs> uh, Jerry thoroughly denies this, but we're going to put him to the test today and see for ourselves. Jerry, I really cannot thank you enough for your time, man. It's really a privilege here, so thanks. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. If I can add any insight or, or whatever, or keep somebody out of trouble or get them in the, on their own road to success, I, I'm glad to help. Thank you so much. Before we get started, I just Burt Backrack, man. That guy is a, a freaking songwriting legend, huh? Yeah. What What it, did you work with him? Well, I was working with. Uh, there's a producer here in town, Keith Thomas, mm -hmm. who's produced you know huge hits and uh, you know he's he's just an amazing R and B producer. But he he does pop stuff and. Uh, he was working uh, with Bert to, for a song. It was for a movie. It was a Bette Midler, Danny DeVito movie. And uh, Bert and the director and the music editor, the three of those guys flew in, and we worked with them for the day and tracked the song that Bert had written. And, uh, yeah, it, it was it was pretty great. And uh, at, at the end of the session, I asked Bert, that at the end of the day, because we worked all day together, at the end of the, at the end of the day, I said, "Hey, Bert, you know, I'm embarrassed, but come on, I, I got to get an autograph." And so Very he cool. said, well, "Sure, sure, Jerry." So he held up a legal pad. I held up a legal pad that I had some. I had folded the paper over where he couldn't see the whole thing, and he signed it at the bottom. And I flipped it up, and I'd written, "I, Jerry Mc, I, Bert Bacharach, hereby." Uh, reassign all my royalties to my <laughs> McPherson. <laughs> I still got it, and uh, and he and he read it, and he said, uh, "I'll have my lawyers get in touch with you." <laughs> Man, that guy's so, royalties. Uh, I, I can't imagine that where happened. I could get all of Burt Bacharach's royalties. Oh but. man, what did you uh, did you learn anything or take anything away from that from working with him? Um, well, it just, 
you know, in Nashville, we, we have kind of a set way of doing things form wise, you know, how the songs, the sections fit together and how they transition from one to another. And Bert just comes from a different school where there's kind of no rules. I mean, just because, yeah, time wise, we would normally have a chorus here. doesn't mean we have to have a chorus here. You know, he's, he just he just goes completely by gut instinct and feel, you know. And he's a br- brilliant writer and really a sweet guy. Yeah, that, that that's um, yeah. He, I mean, I, I, how many hits has he? Re- I mean, I've known his name. I'm 53. I've known his name as long as I've been listening to music, which is yeah, probably yeah. 48 years. And he's still he's still writing. I still play on his stuff. Uh, they, you know, he he lives in Los Angeles, and he sends his stuff to a, a young producer here in town, Brandon Hood, and Brandon will produce it, and uh, we'll either go track it or he'll send me files, and I'll overdub on it here at my studio, and so, yeah, so I, I still work on Bert's stuff. Is a lot of music done that way now? Uh, quite a bit of it is, but. For the stuff that really matters, most of the time you're sitting there with the producer and a lot of times with the artist, too. Define really matters, if you can. Well, you know, <clears throat> by the way, one phrase that I'm going to get really tired of saying, but I'm going to say it several times, is back in the day. <laughs> That's good, man. We're not that far apart age-wise, so you can okay. say that as much as you want with me, please. <laughs> well, back in the day, and when I, mean, when I say that phrase, I mean back in the day when... There were sales of albums, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's on vinyl, whether it's on CD, whether it's on cassette, where you when you bought something, you purchased 14 songs. You didn't stream one song and then go to the next artist. So back in the day when there was a budget and everything, you know, um, there were a lot more gatekeepers, gatekeepers being people at the label that was like, is this person good enough to be on our label? Is this person good enough to produce it? Is this songwriter good enough to get their song on this record? Is this the right song? Is this, you know, there were gatekeepers on everything because there was a lot of money involved. Mm-hmm. And so every once in a while you'll get these projects where there's still money involved and where they're keeping tight reins on stuff. And that's what I call, you know, where where it really matters, you know, because they're they're still treating it like... You know, like back in the day when there was going to be 14 songs sold along with these, you know, in one collection. Yeah, and uh, it, music is definitely not like that. Do you, you're probably like me, I have collect, you know, I, I listen on iTunes, but I buy, I have my own, I, I own all my stuff. I don't stream almost anything. Do you, are you like that or? Well, I ended up, I have to, I have, as a session player, I mean, what will happen is that you'll get a producer or the artist or another player will reference some song, and you're supposed to be familiar with it. And that's virtually impossible to be in the heads of everyone that you ever come in contact and know all the music they've ever listened to, you know, and to know which song applies. So uh, my son turned me on to Spotify a while back, and that way I can type in when I'm on a studio, I can get on my phone listen to the song and uh that they're referencing and most of the time i realize this song has nothing to do with what they're referencing but now i know (laughs) 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 what uh so but in your personal life i mean do you listen to music in your outside of business for recreation yeah it depends on if i'm if i if i'm in a particularly busy period uh, of work where you know you're working from you know basically 10 a.m. till late at night. Uh, I, I typically won't listen to music at that point. You know I'll listen to talk radio, um, just just anything to kind of clear my head and to get my head off of music because I lay in bed and I won't be able to get some of these songs and some of the things and some of the things I played, some of the things I wish I had played. I can't get them out of my my brain. So I have to kind of purge sometimes with just some talk radio. But then there's other times where, you know, where I'm kind of in the retooling, you know, it may be a day of where I, I, I'm not having to be in the studio and I'll listen to music and I'll just I'll just get on and start trying to find stuff, you know. Hmm. Um, what are you working on now 
that's got you most excited? Man, it changes so much from from day to day. Uh, the, the last thing that would, took up a chunk of my time and still does is, uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's it's a it is Facebook has hired a bunch of writers. They have songwriters that write instrumental music, and they're starting to do you know some lyric driven stuff now, artist related stuff. But they want uh, free and clear original instrumental music. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brent Bourgeois, who was in a group, Bourgeois Tag, they were produced by Todd Rundgren, and they had a bona fide hit uh, back, in the, back in the day. Back in the day uh, when Todd Rundgren was a mainstream name, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, Brent heads up uh, the, the music portion that I work on, and he lives in Northern California, and he'll fly into Nashville, or he'll send me stuff. And it's kind of liberating in that, Musically, it is all over the map. So it's like all these different musical styles coming at you, you know, and you just gotta gotta fend them off, or you know, meet them, you know, try to come up with something that sounds genuine to that genre. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a challenge, but it's a lot of fun. What's Facebook going to be doing with this? Well, I know that like they'll take photos that you've done of, on your timeline and they'll uh, put together a montage thing for you and they'll use some of this music. Or you can do that where you can go to Facebook and pick out, you know, music uh, that goes along with, you know, how you're feeling for the your timeline and photos and stuff and put together a little little bitty little movie of yourself. I gotcha. Is that so that's kind of like what sync it, right? Sync is, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, somebody writes it. I don't. I don't. I'm not doing any of the writing. I'm just playing on the stuff. But somebody writes it, and then they hand it off, and they no longer see it. They do it for a flat rate. But uh, the the good thing is that Facebook has really really deep pockets. Um, yeah. yeah, I was going to say you don't have to sit around worrying about if Facebook's going to pay. I would imagine. Right, and and, and they want to treat everyone fairly, and they want to they want to go beyond what you would normally do in paying and because they want everyone to walk away going, man, I'm really glad I did that and I'm going to give them my best and this is going to be a priority when the next time a song comes by or a session for Facebook comes, comes along, you know, you, you, you'll give it a priority. So awesome. Yeah. I, how long have you been in Nashville? Uh, since the mid eighties. What made you come up there? Uh, I was touring, with a uh, Christian singer, Amy Grant. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I I played on and off with her for 19 years, and um, yeah, a, a friend of mine uh, was playing drums with her, Keith Edwards. He lived in Los Angeles, but uh, he would uh, this this label that I was working with in Texas. It was a label called Star Song Records. They would fly Keith down for their sessions. And so he and I got to be good friends. And when the slot came open for Amy's band for a new guitar player, he put my name in the hat. What were you doing before that at that time? Um, playing, I was playing clubs in Houston, Texas, and doing sessions, and a little bit of accounting work. I, I went to Baylor University and graduated with a marketing management degree. Mm -hmm. And uh because i was thinking this music thing may may not work out and it, it you know it did and i'm thinking about selling my marketing management degree <laughs> you know i could put it up on ebay you know <laughs> new condition never been used brand new in parchment still you know <laughs> um <laughs> but 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 here's the deal i started off as i wanted to go into solar energy mm. Um, I was as a kid. I've always been into science and building electronics, and I would make my own circuit boards, etch them, drill them out, load them up with components. I'd make my own fuzz boxes and EQs wow. and different stuff like that. Um, so I've always been into science, and I, I went to Baylor and did a double major in geology and environmental studies. And my guess was if I couldn't make it in environmental studies and solar, I could go into geology and work for an oil company over in Houston. But 
uh, French between French language getting in my way of <laughs> finishing that and the fact that I kept leaving school to go play sessions down in Texas, uh, down in Houston and in Dallas, mm-hmm. I ended up just switching over to, to business and getting out of there with a marketing management degree. Is that where you're from, Houston? No, I'm from Dallas originally. You're from, originally from Dallas. Yeah. What, what kind of, what was your childhood like? It's funny that you like science because I was like really into science and believe it or not, I was an accountant when I first got out of school myself. Oh, that's funny. It yeah. is. Um, well, uh, I grew up my, in a household. I had an older brother, older sister, and um, I still have them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's good, man. Uh-huh. Shout out to Rick and Pam. Uh, <laughs> and, and my dad, Tex McPherson. <laughs> You're kidding. Tex McPherson. No. That's awesome. Tex McPherson, he was a used car salesman and an auctioneer. He, he uh, In fact, when you're an auctioneer and you're, you're licensed for it, you're technically a colonel. So he was Colonel Tex McPherson. There you go. That's pretty bad. Uh, and, uh, and my mom played uh, piano and organ at the church. Oh. And my, my folks were always at church, you know, like Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, and then usually another night somewhere in the, during the week. And my mom was always rehearsing with the choirs or playing for services. They ended up doing two or three services in the morning. She had to play for all those. So I was always around my, you know, my mom's playing, you know, playing piano. Uh, but I never connected with the piano for some reason. You know, I just... I wish I would have. I should have. Yeah, piano is a good. But how did you? So, what were you doing as a kid? Like, when did guitar enter your life? Well, um, my brother Rick, mm-hmm. for Christmas one year, got a Sears acoustic guitar. It was a Victoria, mm-hmm. made in I don't know nowhere around here (laughs) it was an asian little acoustic thing and it played terrible and he had that in a chord book and um uh, he didn't really do anything with it it kind of laid around so i you know picked it up and learned how to tune it and went through the chord book and started learning chords and started feeling pretty good about myself you know that hey look you know i'm my older brother and older sister were impressed, you know? Um, and then something funny happened. I thought I was getting really good on acoustic guitar. I was probably like 10 or 11. And I came home one day and my sister, who I really had never seen pick up the guitar before, she was finger picking house of the rising sun. Wow. Now I was strumming at that point. I wasn't up to finger picking. And it it really kind of made me mad. <laughs> well, no, I could see that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember, you know, grabbing the guitar from her and saying, "That's stupid, Pam." <laughs> and you know, it's the the dumb thing is that that kind of stuck with me. And in the, somewhere in the back of my mind, finger picking is stupid. And, and I never really picked it up. I do a little bit of it now, but. I'm more of a strummy strum strum guy on acoustic. So that was kind of a dumb point in my musical career. No, but it sounds like that you were like had some righteous indignation and that kind of gave you some fuel. Well, yeah. And, you know, as a young kid, you're wanting to rock and yeah. think picking does not rock. Yeah. But ri- I tell you what, righteous indignation has helped me make money in, my, you know, like it's a weird thing. You look and you say, like if someone else is doing something and it motivates you and say, what, what's going on here? I could do this. Yeah. It's kind, yeah. Of, it's kind of weird thing. Yeah. So you're 10 or 11, you see your sister playing and where does it go from there? Like, you know, that's a far cry from where you're at now. How did you take me through the, yeah. the Jerry Mc, McPherson story? If you well, I, I, I was in a band in high, uh, in junior high called blind obedience. <laughs> That's a good name, man. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good name. And um, and we were starting to get, you know, popular in our little area of Dallas. It's, 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 it's not a great area of Dallas. It's called the Grove, Pleasant Grove. And uh, we, we were considered Grove rats, which I was fine with that. Mm. 
uh, but uh, we started playing around and started playing for you know dances and things you know for other schools which that was a big deal when you started getting paid to play for other schools dances you know after after game dances and stuff yeah but then it got good enough to where the band was asked to start playing clubs and that was that was the line in the sand for my parents they, <laughs> They didn't want me playing in clubs. Because you were, what, 16, 15? Yeah, well, I was 15 at that time, probably. Um, and they didn't want me playing clubs, and so I had to quit the band. But at the same time, I was starting to get to play with other stuff that kind of s scratched my itch. You know, like I would play for stuff at church, for some of the little groups there, and with other musicians at school. And... Um, there was a guy at church, a guy named Kirk Dearman, who now lives in Nashville, and uh, he recommended me for a session. Wow. And how, how old are you? I was 15. Holy smokes. What? Yeah. Well, wow. Yeah, I thought. So my sister Pam had to drive me to the studio there in Dallas. I think it was called Summit Burnett, which may have been... T Bone Burnett's dad's place. I'm not sure. Oh. I, I know that. I know that. How many Burnett studios can there be in Dallas? You know. Well, what's odd is that you're a 15 year old kid getting called to do a session in Dallas. It's not like there's a shortage of musicians in Dallas. Oh, yeah, right. There, yeah. There's plenty of yeah. There's plenty of people of qualified musicians because the North Texas was just up the road. So there was there was a lot of players in town. Um, yeah, so my sister drove me to the session, and I carried in my big super reverb and my Gretsch guitar, and uh, realized very quickly that I did not bring a pick. <laughs> and you got to remember, I wasn't a finger picker, <laughs> right? Right. Because of my dumb sister Pam. So <laughs> I, I remember I grabbed a nine volt battery. Uh, you know, I, I kept a nine volt battery for, you know, little phase shifters and stuff like that. Right. And I took the plastic and folded it up uh, and made out of it. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember this, uh, the session going all that great or bad. What it was is they were overdubbing. They had cut these tracks with piano, bass and drums and they needed electric guitar and horns. Mm -hmm. So it was me and three horn players. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but I got a nice fat check, and uh, you know that was that was a long time ago, and it, it, it kind of got me going on this thing of wait a minute, I can do this. My parents are cool with it. I make way more money. It's during the day, <laughs> you know. What's not the love? So that that kind of got me started on sessions. And so. You went? Did you go back to this guy Kurt and say, "Hey, I like that. If you got some more of these, or how, how did like how did you just get more sessions?" Well, just from playing with people, what it was a very natural progression. This happens for a lot of players. You end up playing with someone in someone's band, and they end up going in the studio. And usually, people's first time in the studio, they don't have a lot of dough to pay other players, or they don't have backing yet. So they'll take their band in. So I would get just by default get into play on sessions because I was in the band, you know, playing with different people. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough, or I don't know if I was smart enough, I'll say lucky, to be with, you know, some good singers where they would end up recording, you know, and I would end up going into the studio with them. So this is this was all very organic, very serendipitous. Very, yeah. There, there was no... There was no social media harmed in the making of this. <laughs> 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 no there. advertising. There was no, there was no uh, business plan. Hmm. There was no anything plan. You know, oddly enough, I've I've run my own business for eighteen years, and I worked from in another business before that. But um, over my career, the the people that have done the best are the people that the universe has just supported naturally what they're doing and, and it hasn't been, you know, they had to squeeze blood out of a stone. Right. You know, not, not to say everybody doesn't have bad times. I think that's unrealistic. You're working for yourself. You're going to have good times and bad times, but, um, 
the progression tends to be when it's organic, it's everything sort of falls into place. Yeah, and it's that whole thing of preparation meeting timing, you know. Yes. When you sit in your room and all you do is play, when you sit in your room and you tell yourself you suck, <laughs> and you'll so you'll try harder. And I you know, that, that's that's one of the interesting things about musicianship is that you'll I would see another guitar player and see him playing a lick or whatever and I'll go, "I suck. I can't do that." But conversely, he would see something I was doing, and he would go, I suck, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, so you can you can get this in your head that you need to try harder, you know. Or you can build something up in your head, like in Los Angeles, the musicianship out there is monstrous. And so you'll end up, you know, striving for more than you would have had you had a real outlook on what, the musicianship was like in Los Angeles. Good example. Uh, when I was a kid, a guy came to our church. His name was Paul Anderson. And at some point in his career, he was known as the strongest man on earth. Yeah, I remember that guy. All right. Great gag. You know, to be the strongest man on earth, that's a good gag. Yes, I know that guy. I remember yeah. Him. So he came to our church and he got into wanting to lift weights, but he lived out in the middle of the country. I mean, lived on a farm. And they couldn't afford, you know, gear or anything, you know, the workout stuff. So he started making his own weights. And he would take a bucket and pour concrete in it and set a pole in it and let that harden and then flip it over and put it in another bucket and pour in concrete. And he made his own, you know, workout gear. Mm -hmm. And he said he went to his first competition and uh, walked up to what the guys were lifting. And he went, oh, this isn't as heavy as the stuff back home. Hmm. And... Sometimes when you build up giants in your head, you'll end up working out harder, you know? Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. If, if, yeah. if you want to be better, you gotta, there's only one way to do it, <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. work. And, and, and you got to put pressure on yourself and you got to push yourself. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. You know? So I always, I always thought that I sucked. I still think, you know, I'll leave a session and go, so-and-so could have played this better or faster better faster stronger you know so you're i'm um, you know you're you're always striving to do better what right well that was gonna be my next question is i bet you don't feel much different even though you recognize your playing is of a certain quality but you i think you're you're either the kind of person that's always looking to do better and improve and um or not well and here's the problem with guitar and music and it's this way with a lot of things you know those russian dolls yeah where you lift a lid off and it's like oh there's there's another doll in here and you pull that out and you lift that off and oh there's a there's another doll in here and you lift that off. or or like a rose where you keep pulling back the pedals you're like hey oh here's what that's the way it is with guitar hmm. there's so much to learn it's it's unbelievable. It never stops. Yeah, I, I have this expression, and I got it from, for better or worse, watching uh, my father, who is not a very, who's a very unintelligent guy, and he always thought he was a genius. And I, when I finally got out in the world, I realized that, you know, smart people realize how little they know. You know, it's the guys that aren't really that smart that think they know everything. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So if you're smart, you realize, man, there's a lot to know out there. I better. You know, I'm, school school's never out for the pro kind of thing. Yeah, and, and that's the guy you want. You want to hire somebody that lays awake at night worrying about their tone, about their pocket, the way it fits with the groove of the you know with everybody else that's playing and with the parts, and just everything. You 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 want to hire that guy. You know, you want to catch him on a night where he got some sleep, but you want to hire that. Guy. <laughs> He's awake at night worrying about that stuff. Yeah, that diligence and conscientiousness, that's the, absolutely. So let me ask you this. I know you're a super humble guy, and so this is like maybe a difficult question, but what are some of the reasons why you think you've been called upon so consistently and for so long beyond your ability to play guitar? I mean, there's loads of good players in Nashville, and you've obvious, and there's no doubt you've earned your position technically where you are. But 
n- not all of them are getting called all the time. I mean, you're, you're yeah. in the studio all the time. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, there's two answers f- on that, and one of them deals with more of the musical side. That, but, but first, I'll, I'll speak to what you're asking beyond the musical side of it. You know, why would I get hired over someone else? And one thing I've realized is that there is a th- between players here in town. If I, I don't know how many guitar players are actively doing sessions at you know just about really every day, but you know there's a few and it's a thin line a lot of times between why one guy gets called over than the other guy hmm. it, it just it may be because you just saw you know you're at lunch and you ran into troy lancaster or you know somebody mentioned brent mason or tom bukovac or all these different guys that are here in town uh, can cover just about anything you throw at them uh, and so it comes down to personalities um, a lot of times. Uh, I, I know I've, I've had this said to my face, and uh, it, it, with all good intentions, they were, they were like, man, even if you couldn't play guitar, we'd hire you just to show up because we always end up laughing. Yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I like to have a good time. I like to laugh. Uh, it's you know, it, it, it kind of greases the creative wheels a lot of times mm. because I've seen what happens when there's not a good time in the studio. It can seize stuff up. It can seize up that creative flow and it can seize a team up, you know, a team of players. And we still record old school, get a bunch of guys in a room and talk about serendipitous you know one guy will you know you're getting drum sounds and one guy will be playing something and the producer will go hey what what is that you're playing he goes i'm playing i'm waiting for my chance to get sounds <laughs> <laughs> still end up taking that and working that into one of the we got a song that that could actually work in and then the keyboardist hears that and he says what if you were to take that and do it on the offbeat or whatever there's just when you get a brain trust of guys together, you know, there's there's some really great stuff that happens. And I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of, of that particular thing in Nashville where you get a brain trust of guys together. So is uh, back to the whole creative uh, uh, what can seize up a creative flow when artists sometimes artists can come in and maybe it's their last shot for a single with a record company. They're told that this one doesn't get singled and do well on the radio. We're going to have to drop you. You know, there, there can be things that can seize up a session. Uh, well, they tell you that. Uh, we, you hear that every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, when you hear that, and, and I'm sorry to just take, take a side road here. But when you hear that, how much is it hard to not take that on? It, 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 honestly, it doesn't change anything that I would do. Okay. Um, it, Which means you're given a hundred and you're 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 a hundred ten percent present. Right. Irisp- it, your situation is mutually exclusive from somebody else's. Right, and yeah. and and. You know, I'm I'm always looking out for the song, and I also look out for the singer. Uh, you know, we always pick our spots where we play, and know not to walk on the singer. But you're you're wanting that song to get the very best chance it can get. Hmm. Uh, and there's there's a lot that goes into that because when you hear a song, it, number one, it can it can pull up all these other references in your own head of what this reminds you of that has worked in the past. So you may pull a little bit from that. Um, and, and then through the course of the song, uh, it, I liken it to trying to keep a baby interested. I always think of the listener <laughs> um, yeah, almost like an HD yep. or a baby or somebody who's staring at the radio just looking for an excuse to turn it to the next station. Yeah. You know, because 
you start off with the intro and they're like, oh, okay, what's this? You know, and then you get the first verse. Now you're hearing it. Is it a male singer? Is it a female singer? What are they talking about? You know, uh, and then you get to that chorus. Now, once you've heard the intro, verse, and chorus, you've basically heard the song. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, uh, okay, all right, well, we'll do just a shortened intro so that way you won't turn the dial. And then when we get to the v- second verse, we'll add some rhythmic stuff just to kind of keep every the energy up, keep your energy up. And it's like if you were trying to entertain a baby and you were to pick up a set of keys, and here's a set of keys, and you go, oh, look, here's something shiny, you know. And we'll, we'll add this, and <laughs> you you give them shiny things over the radio to keep yeah. their interest involved. I, I totally get it. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, like, long time ago, when you'd hit that first chorus, you would save stuff for the next few choruses. But most of the time now, for that iTunes preview or most you know young people they don't listen to the whole songs a lot of times you give them the whole shebang in the first chorus yeah attention span and i know exactly what you're talking about because as a as a writer as a copywriter writing letters i've got to get same thing if i don't get your attention early on we're done yes we're we're completely done so i've got to yeah. yeah i totally get it yeah so you and especially with attention spans with you know now we're going to sound horrible with the younger people <laughs> But it's true because it's a different they they've grown up with attention spanless lives. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 think about it, you know, like um a song you know, just think about all the effort that went in from the songwriter's point of view as far as writing a song uh and then the the going through the songwriter process uh, the 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 song choice process um where producers will literally go through three to four hundred songs sometimes trying to find the right set of songs for an artist. Then you get this this machine of people in the studio and assemble it, and you get all this work that goes into trying to get it to its very best point and send it off to a great mixer, and, and it goes through this approval thing with the label, and then it gets on the radio, and somebody will listen to it for, you know, a minute or two, and then they'll go back to YouTube and watch some kid who just got out of the dentist chair and is still on Novocaine or whatever. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the video comes across as more powerful. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a very – I would not want to have to uh, – most of the businesses and projects I'm involved in is, is more – is older people simply because I, I can't – I'm not smart enough, I guess, when it comes down to it, to understand how to communicate with the younger folks. That sounds terribly old, but it's true. Um, yeah. I, it, it's tough. Okay, so look back to the question, I, and I'm sorry for the deviation. So I, what I got out of that is one of the things why you keep getting the call is that you like you, you want to go in the studio to have fun. Yeah, and also, well, well also, I have a, a work ethic that... And actually, I, I feel like I, I picked up on it from uh, this bassist out of Los Angeles, Leland Sklar. Lee Sklar, yeah. Or... Yeah, Lee Sklar. I, I worked with him for a, for a time, you know, quite a bit. And, you know, he's, in my world, he's a big deal. Hmm. So to, to people like me, he's a big deal. And... Um, they would fly him in from Los Angeles, and he would come in. He wouldn't stay in some enormous hotel. He would stay at some very modest place. And when he'd show up to the studio, he was there to work. He was very funny, but he could also be very sober-minded and just like had this focus of, we need to get this done, and at the end of the day, we want these these this artist, this producer, the engineer, all these people to go. Wow, I'm glad we got these guys to do this. Hmm. So I, one thing along with having fun is keeping the focus of getting the job done, and getting it the best. You know, to anybody can do the best if you've got, you know, used to they'd give you, you know, a record company would give a band a crap load of money and say, we'll see you in a year. You know, and you can 
if you have a year to work on something and a big budget, you're going to be able to come up with some goods. Sure. Now we move so fast because there's there's little budget, which means little time, and we're still supposed to come up with something that's going to change the world. You know. Right. Right. Of course. So uh, you got to be you got to be focused for that. You know. So in addition to the, you know, keeping everything feeling good and fun. It's also keeping that 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 session moving along and focused, you know. Do you find um, I always I always feel that work ethic is a very good barometer of like integrity in general because the people that tend to have a good work ethic generally tend to be people of higher integrity and just you could trust them and have you has that been your observation? Yeah, uh, yeah, it has just. Uh, and I, I want to be careful the way I phrase this. A lot of the work ethic comes from other people showing up and maybe having slacked off. What do you mean? So you're having to pick up their slack. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. No, totally, because I always <clears> – <throat> I, uh, I agree with you 100%. I love – when someone comes to me and said, you know, I've worked with a consultant like you in the past and it hasn't been good. And I love hearing that. Yeah. yeah I, honestly, exactly. I love hearing it because I know the bar is, I know what I do, the work ethic I have in the, and when you got a low bar, I have no, there's no way that I, I, they won't come out. They're not coming out of the end really happy. So that's what, I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, uh, and, and musically, you know, uh, just, Musically, a lot of times, there's a lot that's not completed on some of the songs that we're dealing with. Sometimes you get a, a completed demo, and it sounds like a record. And I'm like, why are we recutting this? You know, Is it just in the wrong key or something? But there's times where there's not much there to work with, and you have to come up with a hook line at the very top to get the listener interested. You have to change the chords around to fit the melody better, to make it more interesting. Sometimes you have to hack out a section or add a section. So, you know, there's you have to have quite the work ethic to want to get in there because you could just say, look, once the song has been written, I'll play on it. But do I have to kind of write it, too? You know? Yeah. But that's part of the service, you know, of what we do is getting a song, you know, to in a good song form is that that's that's part of what we end up doing day to day in the studio. I hope this isn't a, t a sore subject. Do you get credit on that? No, not at all. Again, that's part of the service. That's just part of what you do. Okay. Yep. That's um, part of the what's something that surprised you when you first started playing as a session musician? And, and it doesn't have to be a pleasant surprise. It could be like good, bad, or ugly, but just something that was new to you at, at the time. Um, I think what surprised me were surprises. In that, I know that's a dumb answer. No, no, go ahead, explain it. No, uh, no, I, I think I'm uh, going. I'm I'm the type of guy that wants to, outside of the session, plan everything to the last detail. Okay. In other words, you know. OCD. Uh, yeah, pretty much. You yeah. get a call. Uh, you know, hey, what are you doing, you know, Monday, Tuesday of this week? You know, hey, I'm open. Well, great. We're going to be at this studio. And, uh, well, who are we playing? You know, who's the artist? Well, it's this. Well, who's the label? Well, it's this. Who else is going to be on the date? You know, I, I want to know who's coming to the party, you know. Right. <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. What, uh, direction-wise, what are we kind of shooting for, you know? And is there any specialty instruments I need to bring? Yeah, um... You, you end up, I would end up trying to control everything, and that way I could walk in and be the perfect little session player. <laughs> 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 and, um, but then you'll get blindsided every time with something that you didn't see coming. So I would, I, I, it would surprise me that I would get these surprises. But that's that's the nature of creativity. Yeah, yeah. And that's the nature of working with others. Is that they're gonna 
they're going to blindside you with stuff every once in a while, you know? Um, my son, uh, Miles, he got called for a, a, a Toby Keith record. You know, Toby's a country artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've worked on Toby's stuff in the past. I didn't get called for this particular thing. But, um, you know, when you when you hear about a certain artist and you know what they've done in the past, you know what to expect. Well, he walks in, and it's him, uh, keyboardist, you know, uh, piano, acoustic piano, and the guy on uh, nylon string, I think, and then upright bass, and they're playing oh, like wow. jazz tunes. You know, and when I think of Toby Keith, I don't think of jazz. <laughs> yeah, that's not what's coming into your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Upright and, bass. Yeah. And neither did Miles. You know, he got surprised. You know, he rose to the occasion, and we typically rise to the occasion. But it's just that stuff. You try to plan for stuff, and you try to bring the right set of gear and the right mindset and the, and the right chops and everything, and something from left field. You, you just got to – you have to learn to – when, where's it coming from this time, and when's it going to be here? So did that experience, or has that experience, because it's still ongoing, tempered or moderated in some way the, the, uh, the planning, your desire to plan, or your expectations of being able to plan other things? In life? Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I learned during part of this. I have a really good friend of mine, uh, Tom Bukovac, who's a guitar player here in town, mm -hmm. session player. And he's one of the most gifted guys I've ever worked with, gifted musicians. Mm. Uh, he and I were on the, the road together with, with Faith Hill years ago. And when we'd be back in the, in the dressing room, he would pick up an acoustic and he could play any Beatles song, including the Bridges. <laughs> he knew every Beatles song, and every, every day he would play more Beatles songs. And he every day he wouldn't repeat himself, and he wouldn't just hit the high points. And you could tell he hadn't rehearsed these, but he would just play them right off the top of his head. And I realized, you know, for me to be able to do that, I would have to spend the day woodshedding and learning Beatles songs, learning songs that I've heard before. And I would have to learn them and then perform them. And if you wanted other Beatles songs, I would have to go back and learn other Beatles songs. The difference between Tom and I is that Tom has this unbelievable set of ears on him that when he's listening, he's listening actively and it kind of bulletproofs himself for session work that he'll be the last guy to show up. He'll act like he doesn't care because he kind of doesn't. <laughs> and he will point out stuff that is that's not that you would never think about unless he brought it up. And then once he brings it up, you realize, dang, he's right. That is a that is a long solo section or that is a weird way it gets out of the bridge he's he's such a great musician that he he doesn't have to look for surprises or what he's already equipped for surprises and so w what i've been trying to do is as a musician is to actively listen more to music and here where the changes are going um listen to melody that's a huge part and know how the melody fits over the chords and stuff. So that's stuff that I work on. And it's, it's, it's that it goes back to that whole thing of iron sharpens iron. Mm. You know, you get around other, you know, other uh, players that have worked on their chops and stuff, and it ends up sharpening you, which sharpens them, which sharpens you. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it, it's, it, yeah. yeah, you always get, you always, what is it like a rise, what's the expression, a rising tide lifts all boats or something like that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> i'm a firm believer in that you want to be better hang out with better quality people in whatever yeah. you're looking to, yeah i agree with you yeah so that's that's one of the things as far as that I, you know surprises as being a session player is that there's going to be surprises you can plan all you want you know uh i remember as a young guy i would ask for the demo ahead of time you, we don't do that at 
you don't do that now. And somebody would send me a demo and I would learn everything and you would get there and they go, yeah, we're not going to do anything that's on the demo. And you go, <laughs> I'm totally locked into how the demo goes. Now I've got to unlearn it in my head. So that would hamper you actually. That would hamper a fella. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I could see that for sure. <laughs> Especially in, in, uh, mus- muscle memory wise, emotionally, it would just mess with your creativity basically. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. but it's like when you see a video, a music video for a song, every time you hear that song, you think of that video. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's, it's kind of hard to think of it, another mental image, you know, connected to that song. And it gets the same way. If you get locked into a demo, which happens to singers and producers and artists, you know, they they get locked into a demo and it's demo love. You know, they can't <laughs> demo love. see it other, <laughs> than, than the way they first heard it, you know. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. What are some of the, you know, everybody pays tuition in their business as far as mistakes that they made. What are some, like, maybe one or two mistakes you're, you're uh, willing to share with us, mistakes you might have made along this journey and, and the lessons that you learned from that? Um, uh, mistakes. I would think, going back to my dumb sister Pam, <laughs> <laughs> Finger pickings for babies. <laughs> <laughs> that when when you come across something that you know there, it goes to that whole fight or flight thing. Um, when you see someone excelling at something, you can fold your arms and go, "That's stupid," or you can learn it and then find out later if it's stupid or not. I. I I wish I would have known that earlier that don't write off something because it may make you look bad when you first try to emulate it. Mm. You know, it, it's one thing a session, a typical session player does not want to be caught doing is making a mistake. All right. We want everything to be camera ready it's like it's in tune it's a great sound it's a great part it's no mistakes whatsoever but the the legendary performers players and stuff there's warts all over it and but what you hear recorded is free of warts you know they've kind of either edited it out or punched around it or waited for that person to finally get to that magical point. That happens a lot with, uh, I've heard stories on Joe Walsh where somebody would ask him to come guest appear on something. Mm -hmm. The first few run throughs, it's not good. It's like, uh, this is uncomfortable and I think we've made a mistake, but then mistake bringing Joe in even. Yes. Interesting. And then he turns a corner and he changes music at that moment and and plays something that people will talk about day after day after day. But see, a session player, first go-round, could have something that just sounds like, wow, that's really nice. That's, that's really nice. But nobody talks about nice the next day. Right, you know? right. There's... there's it, it's a tricky thing because you you want to, especially in this day and age where things can move so quickly, you want to be able to do it pretty great the first time out of the shoot, you know. Um, but then there's guys like Joe Walsh that it's ugly, and then it turns into absolute magic, you know. And had you had years to work on it, you wouldn't get to the magic of Joe Walsh. Yeah, he's yeah. actually uh, one of my you know, in my top list of guitar players, that's that's amazing. He's 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 a very talented guy. I mean, he plays all these instruments and stuff. Um, and he's got he's a tone monster to me. Anyway, I like I love his. his no, he is. And in fact, you know, I was talking about Tom Bukovac. Yeah. Tom Tom this year is touring with Joe Walsh. He's the other guitar player in the band. Oh wow! Very cool, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. Very. And cool. he's from. They're both from Cleveland. So yes, Tom. You know, we're, uh, Tom working with with Joe Walsh is like me 
if I were out on the road with Billy Gibbons, you know, being from Dallas and Texas and all that. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Uh, 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 but getting back to uh, those mistakes, you know, the mis- mistakes you make. When when I was young, I first tried, you know, I started singing, but I was listening to rock and I didn't like my tone of my voice, so I stopped singing. And that was that was really bad on my part. One, I I may have could have added a zero to the end of my income on some years, you know, depending on who you're touring with. Yeah, sure. Because being able to sing background vocals is huge if you're a side man. Um, then also, just being able to sing melody and hear how melody relates over chord changes that's huge when it comes to playing guitar, any instrument for that matter. Mm. because it trains your ear to listen where the melody is moving. And I, I really wish that I would have stuck with singing. That's a, that's a mistake on my part. Interesting. Yeah, so folding my arms to things that maybe challenge me or that I couldn't sound great at doing quickly and saying, that's stupid. Sorry, Pam, that's stupid. And then also not singing. That That was another mistake. And thanks for sharing that. I think uh, folding your arms to things you can't do is a very... I think that you've got to train yourself and be aware of that over the years because I think it's a, just a natural thing. Yeah. And for everything, you know, your your wife asks you to repair something. And, of course, nobody wants to do it anyway. But, I mean, there's stuff that you probably can do. I mean, in all levels, I think that that's a, 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 an issue. Well, but now with YouTube, you can fix just about anything. Yes, absolutely. I just fixed my washer through the magic of YouTube. <laughs> I did. It, it was a $17 part. <laughs> there you go. Um, it sounds like oh, there's a – there's a you, – you've gotten past it, but I would imagine the – as demanding, like as extractingly demanding as as being a session player is, you really have to um, do some head work. To yeah. that's what it sounds like. That you really have to, you know, be introspective and 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 work hard to keep everything in balance. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in a competitive place like Nashville. Yeah, it's. And balance, that's that's a lifelong uh, goal, is to find the right balance between career and family and, and, and even balance within each of those things. Yeah. yeah. Balance within your career as far as what you're putting your time and attention on, you know, when I'm as a guitar player, you know. I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm always wanting to work on stuff, but... A lot of what I learned on guitar was uh, saying yes to tours where you had to learn 20 to 30 songs of somebody else's parts that you didn't play. And, you know, I uh, touring with Amy Grant, you know, back in the 80s, starting in the 80s, I had to learn a bunch of Dan Huff parts. Are you wow. familiar with Dan? I, I know who he is. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with his work, but I definitely yeah. know who he is. World class guitar player, world class session player, you know, just top, 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 top guy. And uh, he was living in Los Angeles at that time, and he was playing on all of Amy's stuff. And so I had to learn a ton of Dan Huff parts. Not easy. Uh, not easy, but and then. Uh, what was, but but they wanted it not only to the parts they wanted the sounds, and so you know I I ended up talking to him. I ended up staying at his house for a few days once when he was in Los Angeles and going around to some of his sessions with him. But uh, you learn those parts, you learn those sounds, and then you play them hundreds of times, and they get ingrained in you. And so because of that. That was homework, you know. Hmm. Uh, because of that, I got back to town to do session work, and somebody would pull up a song, and I would have a vocabulary of things I could just start doing. Right. You know, for, a, for a particular song. You know, I could do this, or I could do this. 
here's another approach to this song. I could do this. And that's the thing is that in session work, they want you to start moving. And then they'll tell you whether or not you're going in the right direction. So that was kind of school for you in a sense. Big time. Yeah. And, and the thing about it is that Dan at that time was working in Los Angeles and everything was pretty tidy and slick and very produced, you know, like a David Foster type, you know, approach to stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've always been more into rock and stuff that's grittier. And then alternative music came out and I really gravitated towards that. So I would start blending Dan's approach and his sounds with things that felt more comfortable to my ear. So as a result, you know, this, my favorite stuff to play on is kind of alternative, pop alternative type stuff. Like because there's a there's a wide palette of sounds to use effect wise. Uh, you get some atmospheric stuff in there. Uh, you get some rock stuff in there. And it, it keeps me interested in all that, you know. So learning learning band stuff was a huge thing for me. Was that like it, it sounds like it was actually career part of your success in your career? Oh, big time, big time. Yeah. Because I was getting paid playing playing those parts live and then taking the influence of those parts, I was able to quickly in the studio come up with a sound, come up with a part. You know, is that too slick? I can, you know, oh, does it need to be slick? Er, you know, I, I had a, a good vocabulary, you know, for for session work. The flip side of the question of the mistakes that you've made, and again, thanks very much for being so candid on that. Um, what is it? One or two things you did, which at the time was out of your comfort zone, but turned out in hindsight, twenty twenty to be real big breakthroughs, this thing going on tour and learning that stuff for Dan Huff's probably one of them, I'd say. That, that's, that would, yeah, I would have to point to that being the biggest thing yeah. as far as the comfort level of going in front of, you know, when I started with Amy, we were playing big crowds, you know. How big? Um, well, I mean, she was, she had just opened up into the pop world. So like, you know, we were playing the Grammys. We played, you know, the Grammys, we played the Tonight Show, Jay Leno, mm. and all these TV shows and award shows and stuff. It was it was pretty crazy. And, you know, 8,000 seat to 14,000 seat arenas. Oh, and it's pretty. And then some festivals where it'd be tens of thousands of people. But, um, yeah, it, that was kind of out of my comfort zone, but... Once you got the parts under your hands and you felt good about the the sounds and everything that you had, and it was an amazing crew, amazing band. Amy's an amazing person. You you know, everybody went out there pretty confident. Um, someone starting out, they want to be a session musician. What kind of advice would you give them as far as what to do and and what not to do? Well, you know, like just about anything, the hard part is is working on the right stuff. Um, the w one thing that I didn't realize is that where I was hearing the click and where it was, the beat actually was, were two different places. Hmm. So when I first started doing session work, I was rushing, and that's a typical thing to do for a young player and uh, <clears throat> a, a keyboardist out of Oklahoma. I was doing a session with this guy. His name is Harlan Rogers mm -hmm. and groove monster laid. He has a deep pocket, um, but he, he kind of explained it to me and just basically opened up my eyes. I wasn't able to do it, but I finally heard what he was talking about. And this is before Pro Tools where you could see that, see, dude, you're ahead of the grid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you had to use your ears then, you know. Um, so for young players, if they were to realize <clears throat> where they're laying it in with the drums, uh, that's a huge thing. Um, 
also there's such a god there's such a push for learning things on the guitar that you'll never use on a session like shredding <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I laugh because it's it's uh and you and I kind of talked about this a little before it's to me it's saying it's using a lot of energy and notes to not say very much. Yeah, and it actually doesn't get the effect that you're hoping for. Mm. And that's why you don't get asked to shred on sessions <laughs> typically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've ne- you know, it's almost like you shouldn't walk in a guitar store unless you can shred, but that's about the only, you know, the function of shredding is to impress other guitars. <laughs> it's not really a function of music. No. And we all end up with a, with a, with a little, uh, what is it when you have use a bow and arrow, you have a quiver yeah, of bow, you know, a quiver of, of arrows, a, yeah. a quiver of arrows. We all end up with these little arrows of licks and things that sound good when there's no music going on <laughs> yeah. and they'll never see the light of day on a record, but it's stuff that we use to warm up with and that can sound impressive but it doesn't fit in any song. Yeah, no one's ever asked you to shred in the studio, right? Yeah. So, I mean, rarely, you know, they'll say, hey, man, go crazy, you know. But that doesn't necessarily mean shredding either. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, just having that, just getting that fundamental in the pocket with a great tone that's appropriate for the song, um, and that's such a subjective thing. We could do hours on that. Um but with and with parts that fit with the other players and with what's happening with the lead singer. And one thing I've learned in Nashville, musicians have huge freaking ears. Huge ears. I learned so much from doing sessions here in town because you know, somebody'll notice what the where the singer is singing a particular note against a certain chord uh or you'll see a, a steel guitarist marking his chart up where the holes are, where the singer isn't singing. Um, and he knows that he, he needs to stay out of the way and, Oh, look, there's a spot right there I can fill, hmm. you know, and there's kind of rules, old school rules that really don't apply anymore. But when I first started playing on country stuff, um, you know, the, the piano would take the second verse fills. Say yeah. that again. The piano would take the second verse fills. Yeah. Instead so of instead of the guitar. Around, it, it was yeah. You know, when second verse comes around, it's time for the acoustic grand to play fills and stuff. <laughs> okay. So it was just a way of arranging stuff out because you know music started out off being arranged. And you look at our time, our union time cards here. They there's still a a space for a ranger to sign his name. No one ever signs it because there's no arrangers. Hmm. We all self-produce and self-arrange. You know, uh, all the, you know, well, I, I don't know if I can say all the Motown stuff, but a lot of the Motown stuff was written out, you know. Interesting. Some of those great parts that you hear and you go, man, what great musicianship. A lot of that stuff was written out. You know? Even for guitar. Well, yeah, and, you know, <clears throat> like, especially like a, when I think of like uh, bass parts, hmm. like uh, like a James Jamerson kind of thing, yeah, like Jackson Five, I want you back. All right, boom. That was all written out. That was written yeah. out. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Why? Well, because. Uh, now that would have been your gig, man. Yeah. <laughs> right? You just no no questions there. Man. Yeah, here's the deal is that it came from an orchestral background, you know, ensembles. You can't just have people just making up parts uh unless it needed to be Dixieland where it's just kind of that beautiful mess. Mm. Um parts you know, an arranger can make sure that what's in the right hand of the keyboardist is not conflicting with what the second guitar player is doing and what the kick drum is doing 
and the back part of the measures of the chorus is it conflicting with what the bass is doing? They would write stuff out, and they could look at the staff paper and see as they go across all those musical lines on the staff paper how everything lines up and there's no clutter. You're not going to have to mute anything later. It all works. And that's the way that's the way everything started. And you had to be a reader. And I've never been that much of a reader at all. But now things have progressed to where musicians self-produce and self-arrange. And so in other words, you're listening to everyone on the floor. You're listening to the drums, the bass, the keyboards, the other guitar player, what the acoustic guitar player is doing, what the steel player is doing, what the fiddle player is doing, what the singer is doing. And there's a lot to take in. Oh, yeah, massive. Yeah, and to do it quick, there's, there's a lot going on. Hey there, this is Craig Garber. Thanks so much for listening to part one of my interview with Jerry McPherson. Uh, on the next episode, we'll hear part two. And on part two, Jerry and I are going to talk a lot about his guitars, including uh, finding out what his go-to guitar is, what happened to all the guitars that he had that got messed up in the flood of 2010. He actually lost 17 guitars there. And uh, he talks about his influences, and we talk about pedals and just the nuts and bolts of playing. Uh, this was a fantastic in- interview for me. I was like... Uh, kind of a kid in the candy store. Uh, if you don't know who Jerry is, see if you can do some research. I mean, he, he's really, you know, like a legend in in uh, in studio, A-list first call session players. So, again, uh, thank you for listening, and I will look forward to the next show, which will be part two of my interview with Jerry McPherson. Take care and have a great one. Hey, thanks very much for listening. You can sign up to get notified of future episodes on our website at everyonelovesguitar.com. Now go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, I'm out. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.